start the recording. There we go. I want to welcome everyone today to the Conservancy's Conservation Cat Chat. And our special guest today joining us from Sydney, Australia is Margaret G. Hi, Margaret. Hi. <laughs> Hi with the cold. Um, you can't catch a cold from me. <laughs> <laughs> she has a cold. And I'm just getting over my laryngitis, so we're, we're hanging in there. But uh, Margaret is our Australian ambassador for the Snow Leopard Conservancy. And I'm going to let Margaret introduce herself to you. She's going to tell you a little bit about herself and how she came to be affiliated with us and a little bit about her career history. It's, it's fascinating. And then we're going to talk a little bit about searching with, for the snow leopards. So take it away, Margaret. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my background, I was actually brought up in the country and there are always lots of uh, wild cats, the little, I mean, ordinary cats around. So I've had a long association with rescuing and caring for cats. And then started out as a journalist with a big city newspaper and tumbled into book publishing because a friend of mine, politician, was having a book published. And I thought, wow, it was that light bulb moment. So didn't go back to university, didn't go back as a journalist, should have gone back to university. But anyway, um, so it's been like a blink of an eye over 30 years and um, uh, mainly nonfiction. And I like commissioning from scratch a book, literally a scratch, no pun intended. And then Adala and Rodney were visiting Sydney for an event at the Australian Himalayan Foundation. And my sister had started an adventure travel company with her husband. So that was the connection to the Himalaya. So I'd been to Nepal trekking and um, particularly then to Bhutan in the Eastern Himalayas um, and finally to the Indian Himalaya. Anyway, long story short, um, we sort of invited Dala and Rodney kind of to come over for dinner after this event. And of course, my husband and I fell in love with them because they're so passionate and amazing and hardworking. And I'd always uh, been drawn to snow leopards that didn't know that much about them. And so it just sort of rolled on. And I actually feel um, a bit disappointed I didn't do as much as I had hoped I could for them. It's very hard to fundraise. And as you know, with a singular animal and people think, I'll never see this animal. I don't know where they are. You know, is it a tiger? Is it a lion? You have to tell them how special they are, even though you, it's very rare to see one, of course. Um, but the, the thing I thought I can do is to use my knowledge and expertise. So I thought, I do books, I gotta do a book for them. And Siobhan needs, you know, like the Legion d'Honneur in France or whatever, for sticking with this wretched book because <laughs> it took five years to come out. Everyone said, no, the book publishers said, well, how many of this thing are we gonna sell? You know, snow leopards, like, we don't really get it. And I tried all the university publishers who say they're interested in wildlife and con conservation. And in the end, they're businesses. It's how many of this thing are we going to sell? It was like they were thinking about selling toothpaste or shoes or something. It was so dis dispiriting. And of course, and since finally, it was all pre-pandemic, we didn't know there was going to be a thing called COVID-19, of course. Yeah, that, that has hammered <laughs> a lot of things. But even so, um, there was... A, a publisher in India was quite interested um, and that was a bit of a spark. And then an old contact of mine, he's not that old, he's younger than me, everybody's younger than me, <laughs> um, at Skyhorse in New York said, I love this. And it's like, I think I burst into tears. And I told Javon and we all cried. And then this wonderful uh, photographer in Sweden, um, Jorn Pearson. And, you know, when you're in writing and text, you always think photographers do incredible images, writers do incredible text, but they're separate. It's black and white. And I was astounded at the text, the poetry, the dreamlike writing I was seeing from everybody. It was just a revelation, these beautiful po like poetic essays about snow leopards. And um, so that was just fabulous. And so then the book finally came out with this arresting image, of course, of this beautiful snow leopard in the wild taken by the Spanish photographer Oriol Alamany. And um, my husband got a copy of that for my birthday last year. And so it, it's been the highlight of my whole life um, just to do this one book. It has meant the most to me. And of course, I can boast later about seeing a snow leopard in the wild in Ladakh, but maybe someone else should have a go. <laughs> you know, it, was, <laughs> it was interesting when Darla first approached me, she'd received an email from you and she said, there's our Australian ambassador, Margaret, would like to do a children's book 
And she goes, I thought it was right up your alley. Would you like to tackle this? And I was like, sure. And my first thought, I started, you know, thinking about what pictures we had from captive as well as wild snow leopards. But I had done a newsletter article with Oriel and Bjorn Pearson and where they had described their experiences uh, looking for snow leopards in the Himalayas. And I started thinking about them and I got a hold of Bjorn. And it was Bjorn really who came up with the, the core idea of, he said, Siobhan, why don't we just focus on manually taking pictures, no drones, no camera traps, people where there's actually a person behind the camera that's interacting with this animal. And why don't we just focus on that and the trek? And I said, wow, that's perfect. And I said, but Bjorn, I need your help with the text. And he sent me a file of little snippets of text, which were incorporated into the book. Most of them are found at the beginning of each chapter um, is something that he wrote or I incorporated what he wrote. But you're right, Margaret, these essays that they were sending were unbelievably poetic and creative and uh, it was amazing. It just, I, I would get goosebumps and tears when I would read, when they'd send them to me. I couldn't wait for the next one to come. Yeah. And so the idea of a small little children's book suddenly blossomed into this great big, huge mm -hmm. thing. And it just grew sure. and grew and take on a life of its own. And it's funny until you just mentioned that we started out with a different publisher. I had forgotten all about that. <laughs> But we were a year <laughs> with a different publisher, a university publisher who didn't really want to do it, but kept messing around with us until finally we just said bye. And we went on and it's, it is so, I knew it was difficult to public, get a book published. I, it amazes me how anyone ever gets anything published. And I knew I was going to be in trouble with the editing. I knew that was going to be, you have to not take everything personally and I was going to have to be tough. And uh, he, it was amazing. The first correspondence I received from our editor, he said, oh, I know exactly what, where you're going with this. He said, I've read Peter Matheson's book. I, I know all about this mysterious, elusive animal and about the experience and how it's a spiritual thing. And he said, that's exactly where you want to go. And and he said, but you've got to write me a chapter that's all about the spirituality and the legends and the folklore. And I said, awesome. Well, how long do I have? Oh, a couple of weeks. Is that long enough? You know, yeah. <laughs> and, but it was, he was a joy to work with. Absolutely. And very easy to work with, because if I was really stubborn about something, he'd say, sure, I get it. Let's leave it. Um, but it was, I don't know how you do this and how you've done it all these years. I know you've written and you've been an editor. And, and this was turned into like my baby, you know, it just, um, and it was everybody's baby. And I had to be very sensitive to all the contributors, you know, not only their photographs, but their writings. And we were dealing with people from all over the world where English was a second language. So I had to do some translating and editing, and then I had to pass it on to him. And then he passed it on to the copy editor. And it just, um, after a while you start, you know, is this what I meant to say? And I had to go back to the original, some of the original writings and go back to what we originally said, because it, after it goes through so many different people, it gets out of hand, I found. You know, it starts to not sound like what you want it to be. But it was a joy. It was probably the most fun thing I've ever done. It was exciting. Thank you for I, getting us into this. <laughs> well, you know, Siobhan, I think the thing is we knew we had one shot at this, you know, and it was just a miracle we got this wonderful publisher, Skyhorse, who got it. And, uh, you know, it was about for the animals. And, you know, at times, even though, you know, it drove us crazy, we knew, uh, of course, they're worth it. So we had to keep chugging. And everyone, it was such a, an incredible team effort. But you're right, it started as a kid's book. I thought of idea, but of course, now the book is across the entire spectrum. Anyone from a child to an adult can enjoy it, even if they're just looking at the pictures. And of course, it's very informative. You know, it really discusses their habitat and, and their solitary nature and a lot of other stuff. 
because you know people think they're like you know maybe like lions that live in prides and things like that and so uh, I learned a lot of stuff and uh, so it endures and I hope it stays in print indefinitely. Uh, well, it was, it's taken fun, quite it was well. fun to keep your original idea in the center of the book that section the elusive leopard where you look at the one photograph in full size and you try to find the snow leopard and then you look over to the right where it's blown up and it's kind of fuzzy but you can then you can find the snow leopard and I've tried it out with some of my friends because to me obviously I can find it right away but they can't find it and yeah. it was it's that was the core of the book and and our editor was so he's like yeah yeah that's great let's keep it and he was even frustrated with his people because they didn't get it and he's like no you've got to have the full picture on the one side and the little picture on the other blown up and it was it went through three or four tries before they got it right it was kind of funny but because I, that, that's really the whole thing anyone who's out been out there in, in the dark or nepal wherever um you know you can be looking straight at a snow leopard as i was and i was saying to the truck but i can't see it but i knew it was there but the, the camouflage is so extraordinary it's really only until they move that you have a really good chance at seeing them uh and so and that was such a critical thing that they camouflage um and it also keeps them alive in many instances what was, what was that experience for you did you go in 2019 or 18 19 it was that? uh it was january 2020 just before this wretched pandemic struck oh, wow. and i've been planning it for sort of one or two years and i took a very dear friend uh my original trekking guide from uh, Bhutan called Pesa, who's become, I, I don't have kids, he's become like our son. He's in his 30s now and he speaks Hindi, Nepali, understands Tibetan. He certainly was able to manage very well and be an enormous help um, in uh, Ladakh. And another friend who'd been actually an ambassador in China, but is very interested in wildlife, wasn't spectacularly fit or more worried about <laughs> would he make it than <laughs> anything else, but he, he managed reasonably well. Um, but when we arrived in Leh, you know, the pilot says, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, it's minus 20 degrees. And I think I said a really bad word very loudly. <laughs> but you get out and it's sort of bracing, you know, it's invigorating. But as they say, there's no such thing as cold weather, just the wrong gear. I just, when I go back, I'll have slightly better gear. And we climatized in Leh, the capital of the duck, for three days. And then we took off and we thought... In, in Asia and throughout the Himalayas, they'll often say, oh, it takes, it's about a two-hour walk. And you always know, I should have known, that means five or six hours. <laughs> so it ended up being five or six hours through icy tracks and snowy uh, landscapes. But we had this brilliant trekker um, who works at SLC in the Indian Snow Leopard Trust, Jigmet Dadul, who's seen snow leopards about 300 times over 20 years, some with the naked eye, a lot with telescopes. And we saw... A, foot, a, a, a pug mark and I'd said to Pays are on the plane because he's so very spiritual and very out there and delightful and I said do you really think we'll see one and he said we will so of course I knew we would <laughs> and when we saw the the, the pug mark and Jignard said, Jignard said there's one in the area but of course they can disappear in a heartbeat so we were very emboldening it was very very cold when we stopped our hands and feet we just felt frozen and you have to keep drumming your feet on the ground and clapping your hands because you can get frostbite because it was minus 20 there. As the day drew on and we eat now soggy or half frozen tomato sandwiches, getting towards the village. Um, I don't want to mention all the names uh, of the villages. I know people don't talk about them that much, but uh, we're near this village, uh, which sadly has just had a COVID a fatality, which I'm very distressed about. And we got there and it's like, but where, which farmhouse are we at? <laughs> because there are about nine or 15 houses, I think. And our guides are a bit behind us. So we sort of think, we're, we're, and we're so cold. And we got there, uh, took up, finally got this lovely farmhouse, wonderful Ladakhi hospitality, warmth and very welcoming, gave us uh, hot tea and everything, just taking our jackets off. And Norbu, one of our other tra trackers, who is a very experienced guide in the area, just had been outside immediately, didn't worry about having a cup of tea, just went up to the platform and started looking for snow leopards and he rushed back and he yelled out there's a cat and I would say to someone I would have got out my underpants I just flew out and the, and the ducky woman saying Margaret ja madam madam jacket jacket grab the jacket I half put my shoes on nearly broke my neck tripping over my laces I had to go up an icy slope I knew I had this is my moment 
this is so limited. And I thought, oh God, it could disappear. Get up there, get up there, get up there. So I got up there and then, you know, Jigmet's there with the telescope. I think it was about 300 meters away. And he's saying, look, Margaret, look, look, snow leopard. But I could, all I could see was this brown cliff. And I said, Jigmet, I know I'm looking at it. I know it's looking at me. I can't see it. And he said, keep looking, don't, don't move. So I was just glued to the spot. And then it moved. It was like seeing a big Labrador with black markings moving up. And then my good luck was it went up onto this very icy slope. It sort of looked back at us. I felt it was saying, hey, get over here. Like, I'm here. Like, you know, just do it. Look at me. Look and, at me. Yeah, look at me. Look at me. And um, then it charged down this slope. Clearly, it was chasing, um, you know, a blue sheep in the area that we'd seen them in the area. But we didn't see the, the prey. We just, he sort of zigzagged. And I could see the snow crystals flying up his tail was up oh wow where well, I saw the whiskers but maybe I imagined that but I could see the markings very clearly and you had this sense of you're looking at a lethal beautiful apex predator and he just looked so magnificent and he looked happy he was in his perfect environment he was at home charging down asleep having the time a slope having the time of his life and it was magical. It was probably all over in, in minutes, the actual him going down the slope. Probably the whole experience is 10, 12, 15 minutes tops. And we all burst into tears. And I thought, I can die now. This is the best thing it's ever. I've done everything now. Seeing a snow leopard is it. And it, it's a strange well, thing. The, the wildlife, well, the photographers say it's it's in their bucket list. It's I know Jack Wonderly, uh, one of the contributors, uh, he, from California, he said that he'd photographed all the other cats, um, and that was the ultimate. And and he talked yeah. about, you know, he was in a tent, and he said yes. everything froze that wasn't inside his sleeping bag. Everything. Yeah. And I know Bjorn. Uh, he said that he had photographed all the other big cats, and it was like the number one thing to do. And Oriole, he and his wife traveled to India. Oh, I think four or five times. And yeah. before they even did a photographic thing, they scouted it out for two or three years. And then they kept going back year after year until the pandemic stopped them, you know, to take pictures of the same family of snow leopards. And uh, it's, it seems like they become, um, they develop a bond between these individual animals that they photographed over and over again. Well, as you know, and it's in the book that in the Himalayas, they see it as a great blessing to see um, a snow leopard. It somehow takes hold of you in quite a mystical way. And, you know, some of the other photographers, I mean, my experience seeing the snow leopard was, uh, you know, I said 10 or 15 minutes, but, you know, some of them had the great good fortune to really see a snow leopard for many, many hours and nearly mm -hmm. froze to death doing it. But they knew this opportunity may never present itself again. And it is quite difficult circumstances. Overnight there, it's minus 30, which you should really only be out for one or two hours tops. Because we went to another village uh, a few days later and we didn't see one, although a mother and two cubs had been in the area. And it was witheringly cold. And when you get up around four, four and a half thousand metres, you know, it's tough. I was chock full of this drug called Dimox, which helps your, stops your brain from swelling. Some people take it, some people don't. But I'm glad I did take it because I didn't want to get cerebral edema. I didn't even have a headache. Uh, I'd wake up at night just because I was feeling a bit cold. But of course, for the Ladakis, you know, I mean, they know it's special and they care about the animals. And now they've got these homestays. So they don't, you know, at times there were animals were killed. And, and the Hemis National Park is now a complete uh, conservation area. And they're not allowed to kill them. If you kill a snow leopard in Nepal, Bhutan or India, you get like, as you should, at least 20 years jail. But to them, you know, it's sort of, I said to them, you know, I guess you see snow leopards a lot. And like we see kangaroos and koalas in Australia and it's no big deal. But I said to them, it must be like us seeing a kangaroo in Australia. And they said, it is a bit like that. They see them so regularly that they think these crazy tourists come here and pay this money and go out in the cold and uh, just to see a snow leopard, but it's in their backyard. It's maybe like, not exactly like coyotes or bears or something in America, but it's, it's part of what they've grown up with. And, but they were delighted. Margaret, did, so did you have a chance to stay at one of the Himalayan homestays? Yes, in, um, in Ladakh, in this remote village, um, uh, we were staying at a farmhouse. And that's been a fantastic 
way of them earning money and uh, being involved with the conservation process. And it's quite good money. We each pay a certain amount. We also tip them, like left them gear and all sorts of other stuff. And it's a wonderful sense of connection. And this big, there was a, a mother and her um, daughter who was probably in her early 30s and her husband uh, who was with the Indian Army or something. He was there on holidays and their son and the old people, they all sort of lived together. And it was quite um, a, a basic sort of place. Um, they didn't have like a normal bathroom. They had a long drop sort of pit toilet thing out the back, which was a bit of a challenge in the middle of the night, very icy slope. But they were so lovely to us, you know, and I, I stayed in the kitchen. They had these uh, bakari, like a pot belly stove, which they fuel with yak dung. So I got a bit of a, a sore throat from the yak dung smoke, but I was okay, but it keeps you warm. But our, our water bottles froze inside the house. And wow. at night, these people go off to an unheated room and they were, you know, I'm about three o'clock one morning, I felt this presence in the kitchen. I thought, oh, maybe it's a snow leopard. And it was this lovely woman saying, you know, are you all right? Are you warm enough? And she bought a blanket. They, they were just treated us like babies. They were so lovely to us. And they have this lovely expression, julaise. When you say hello and you say goodbye, you say julaise. It's very uplifting. And they always say, see you again, see you again. And, you know, we were hugging them and in tears when we left. And we told them what... A, remarkable once in a lifetime experience it was it was very moving i think I have, um, very often. i have rodney and darla here they've joined us and i've asked them to unmute themselves and i wondered if you know they wanted to if they had some questions or um, wanted to join in i i can't imagine you know they spent like four and a half years in a tent you know i it just that blows my mind i guess yeah, <laughs> um, not for the faint-hearted, as they say. <laughs> no. Hi, Rodney. Hi, Darla. Um, hi. Hi. Thank you for joining us Rodney. today. Um, I wondered if you Love wanted to video. say hi to Margaret and if you had some questions. Okay. Or... So nice to see you, Margaret, on the other yeah. side of the world. <laughs> yeah. It's sunny um, today, even though it's winter. It's 19 degrees. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Well, I love your description because it just reminds me of being in Ladakh. You know, living in the tent was a challenge, no doubt about it. <laughs> And those homestays with the fire in there, we never had a, a, a way to heat ourselves in the tent. Exactly. Um, and the only way I could get heated is go out walking, actually. <laughs> Darla, keep moving. That's Darla the wrote keep all moving. the book and sit in a, you know, lying in a sleeping bag, at least in winter. It was, it was warm in spring or summer. No problem. Uh, but anyway, yeah, this brings back so many memories. Thank you for sharing this with us. Well, you made it happen. I it it was really meeting you guys. One, it was baby steps, and then uh, to be in Ladakh. And I dream of going back. The first time I can get on a plane and get to Lay, and back with Jigmet and Norbu and all the people there. And we went to the um, conservation, the trust uh, building there, and it was very deep snow. It was the that the the place itself looked like an igloo. There was so much snow, and you know it was spectacularly beautiful. And we went to a lot of the monasteries in the area. Uh, we were acclimatizing, but it was wonderful also to connect with the culture before going out into the wild. And, um, you know, it's uh, there's so many other villages I would like to visit. I mean, I was saying to you the other day that Jigmet's very funny. When we're in the first village and then the second one, um, I said, well, I'd love to go back to these places. Oh, no, no, we can't go back there. He said, they're getting too crowded. I said, Jigmet, we're the only people there. <laughs> there was us and a few farm, the farm people in the farmhouses, but he thought it was, I said, it wasn't Delhi, you know, what do you mean it was crowded? <laughs> it's so funny. I wouldn't mind camping. I'd like to try it because I think that I'm the tents lined with wool, with felt. So I have uh, tried camping out in Ladakh. You know, uh, did you see the, the leopards in Hule? Uh, Hule, is that where you are? Oh, Rumbak. Uh -huh. Rumbak. Rumbak. Oh, yeah. and they didn't have you camping, huh? So no. the cats are showing themselves even more than before, it sounds like. Well, you know, we'd seen the pug mark going in and then to see one on the very first day was just, you know, seemed like incredible good luck. And when we went to Ule, there'd been a mother and cubs in the area. But, uh, you know, Jigmet is like, has an animal intuition himself. And he said, they've gone. He just knew they weren't in the area. And we scanned until we were cross-eyed and frozen stiff. But they weren't there. Um, but it was a beautiful place to go to. And there's a very interesting man there. Um, 
who had been involved in making documentaries about snow leopards. He actually had a whole lot of cats and kittens and the mother cat had been taken by a Himalayan uh, a wolf or a, a red fox the night before, but incredibly, a few days before, but incredibly the kittens had bonded with the father, the tomcat, and he thought he was the mother. So I've never seen a tomcat taking over the looking of these little, looking after these little kittens. And the little kittens were snuggling up to him and trying to suckle him mm. because they were looking for the milk. It was the cutest thing. <laughs> wow. I remember you said you wanted to bring one of the kittens home with you from your trip. Oh. Of course, <laughs> lazy cat lady, big and small cat. Well, Darla's here with us too. Did you want to join in? I do. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, I think most importantly is how amazing it is that Siobhan was able to put together a book of photographs that were all taken with a handheld camera. That's the difference between 15, 20 years ago and now, is that conservation effort made it possible for legions, you know, relatively legions of people to actually go to Ladakh and other places. Ladakh is the best place to have the best chance of seeing a snow leopard. You have to do it in the winter time. I think pretty much um, every place you have a good chance of seeing a cat, you have to do it in, in winter because in the summer, they could be anywhere in those mountains. And camera traps have made a big difference, but Ladakh's story is really a story of conservation. Yeah. Um, 20 years ago, the, the herders were still retaliating against the cats. And because of the um, instigation of the homestays and the snow leopard trips, the, the communities who don't like to kill anything anyway um, have found alternative livelihoods and they've come to really respect the fact that, you know, there are people who do want to see them in the wild and that can support them in um, a way that even their livestock cannot. So, you know, that's amazing that this whole book of photographs, not one of them was taken without a handheld camera. And the other thing I wanted to say is that Margaret, you've, you know, you said something about wishing you could do something more, but the, the, the book is one of the best ways to spread the word. People who may ne never be able to go up into the mountains because for whatever reason, are able to vicariously visit the area through these photographs and really, really moving essays of people who have put themselves in, you know, dangerous conditions and freezing cold conditions in order to have the chance to see the cat. So thank you, Margaret. No, it is an enduring thing. And I'm sure, as I said, they'll keep it in print and it'll it'll just keep going. It is the best calling card SLC or Snow Leopards can have. And, um, you know, it's, uh, so it was just wonderful. I, I always felt it would happen, but it was a long, slow struggle. And what Siobhan and, and uh, all the contributors did was a remarkable for no, for no financial gain whatsoever. And these are professional wildlife photographers trying to struggle, you know, to survive anyway, all artists, artistic people struggle to survive. So they were so big hearted and, uh, very much doing it for the common good of, of the snow leopards. And I can't wait to get copies, you know, to Ladakh and that, but the moment we can't post anything there because of the pandemic. So it's very frustrating. But my dream is to be able to personally handle hand copies to our dear friends in Ladakh, Nepal, Bhutan. I was going to say about Bhutan, it's very rare, as you know, for people to see them in Bhutan. Uh, there's snow leopard experts over there who may have seen just a glimpse of one and half the time they don't know whether it was just a, a dreamscape thing or they actually saw one. So Ladakh, yes, in deepest winter. And we saw them in early January, which I know Ronnie had said it's a bit better to go in February, but that didn't suit uh, our travel plans. So uh, we really hit the jackpot seeing that beautiful. Yeah, you did. On January the 8th. Ooh. Very lucky. Yeah, before the, most of the people the go. I'm sorry, go ahead, Rodney. Uh, that was a little before most of the people go. And it, it, I agree, actually, it's a good time to go because the cats start mocking 
and their yep. breeding season peaks in uh, February and, and early March. So this is the very beginning of it, and the cats are running around looking for one another. Yeah, yeah. It's, it just suited us because, you know, as you know, my husband's a volunteer doctor in Bhutan, and he'd been there for a couple of months, and we just couldn't stay away from Australia for, you know, four or five months. So and we're going on to a book festival in India, so it just worked out very well. And um, I, I knew, my only regret is I wish we'd stayed a little bit longer in Ule. Um, I think a cat may have come back. You get sort of hungry for another sighting. Um, uh, but there will be another time. Um, God, Buddha and Ganesha willing. I can't wait to return. And um, I'm sure many of you feel the same way. Um, time will tell. Um, if anyone has any questions for Margaret or Rodney or Darla, uh, you can leave them in the chat and I can uh, pass them along as we talk. Because this is um, very Rodney, informal. Can I, just, can I just ask you, Rodney, when were you last in Ladakh? Um, in uh, November 19. And then the pandemic, of course, hit, and I had plans to go in 20, but obviously that hasn't happened yet. We were you with a, was that with a group? Was it a research trip? It would have been a research trip, but how many people were in your group when you went there last time? And did you see oh, a cat? The group would have been earlier, um, probably three years ago. Okay. I went this time to meet with SLCIT yep. and, and JIGMET, of course. Yeah. So I was just there kind of a short time, taking fox lights up to them, those yeah. light deterrents to reduce livestock depredation. Yeah. I guess you've been, I believe, Spitty. I'd love to go to Spitty. Spitty yeah. is beginning to have a lot of sightings as well. In yeah. fact, uh, if you look on the YouTube, there's an Indian uh, local people driving a little car along the road. The road's partially melted. And the cats walking along the side of the road, following the car. I actually have seen humble. that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and where else are they showing up? So when I went in November, we went to a different area. We went further down the Indus Valley to mm. a new homestay area that uh, is very spectacular. Mm. And we didn't see snow leopards. We saw a lot of sign. Uh, and we saw the, you know, the blue sheep, of course, but not snow leopards. Yes, it's just a, you know, a sort of a happenstance thing. Um, yeah, it's, um, yeah. Uh -huh. you know, the homestay thing, as Dala said, it's just been so fantastic to uh, link everyone together. And the homestays does give them good income. It, you know, really encourages more and more deeper conservation. And it's just a, a feel-good experience all around. Right. And there are now probably hundreds of homestays throughout Ladakh. They've just really been taken up by the local people in so Marari and just different parts of Ladakh. So you, you know, you don't have to depend upon a, a sort of a, a hotel. It's not the best place to meet people or see how people live. Exactly. And they make this beautiful soup, as you know, this Tukpa soup, it's a, a vegetarian sort of noodle soup right. and these lovely yes. noodles. It's very nourishing food. In fact, they load you up. It's only a wonderful carb loading and veggie loading experience. So we were so well looked after. Actually, when we were in Ley, uh, I think the previous year, that actually had a snow leopard in the town, in the local mosque. He'd been wandering around. But I think he wasn't very well. I think he might have had to have been euthanized. Because as you know, if they're coming that close to people, they're not, they're disoriented. There's something not right. The wildlife department has been, you know, from time to time they called uh, by local villagers that have them trapped in a, uh, a livestock pen. And the departments come in, uh, immobilize them, move them, and release mm -hmm. them away from villagers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is what happened uh, with this cat in Lay, um, yeah. but it happens often, frequently. So the other place that I'm thinking about um, is China, too. You know, you don't expect uh, you hear all these horror stories of China, but there's one area, and it's a Tibetan area again, where snow leopards are being sighted uh, almost every year, and oh. often from quite close. And what's nice about it is that some of the younger Chinese are finding out about these places, and, and you know, the adventure travelers, and they go in there. So I think this is a good sign for this kind of localized stewardship of snow leopards and other wildlife to proliferate. Exactly, and there will be generational change, I'm sure, in general with animal 
rights and awareness uh, of everything, I think there will be enormous generational change in the attitude towards conservation and not eating wild animals or using them for fur, which of course is horrific. So let's hope for the best in that regard. Exactly, yes. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Margaret, on your travels, uh, that last trek that you were on, did you see any wild packs of feral dogs or any individual feral well, dogs? Well, you know, um, I love all animals uh, and, you know, I'm quite a strict vegetarian. I sort of can't eat animals. So it's very distressing for me when I see, uh, well, wild animals in distress, of course. And in Ley, there are a lot of stray dogs, which are in a terrible state. There is a, a wildlife shelter, uh, there is a shelter there. But, you know, in winter, it was very upsetting seeing uh, pups and that injured, sick, um, starving, no shelter. Um, I, I picked up, a. I saw a pup one day. I didn't pick him up because there's rabies there. I would have I took it back to the hotel. The shelters were shut. It was terrible. Out in the, actually in Rumbach, there were a couple of, there, there, we saw some dogs, but I didn't see feral dogs there. I think they were owned by people. People were around them. So they were part of the herders, uh, watchdogs, or whatever you want to call it. But it has been a problem. And Rodney and Darley, everyone would know, there have been attacks by dogs uh, of snow leopards. They're uh, encroaching into snow leopard habitat whole lot of reasons, um, hunger, um, whatever, uh, lack of food, yeah. um, and it's very dangerous for snow leopards. Um, in Bataan, there's about 300,000 stray dogs. They will not uh, do very much about the population. They think that desexing, neutering is the only answer, but it hasn't worked that well because a lot of people where they had pups, they don't take them to be desexed, it's free. So they are also attacking all sorts of wildlife in Bataan, all sorts of wildlife in Ladakh throughout the Himalayas. Um, it's an out of control situation. And because of their Buddhist beliefs of not taking life, and you know one has to respect that, uh, they will not euthanize. Uh, they will not uh, kill some of these dogs to protect right. wildlife. Mostly they won't do it. Occasionally if a dog is sick or injured or has cancer or something, they will put them down. They won't put almost any animal down who's suffering. And that I find that difficult, even though I'm philosophically a Buddhist, I find it difficult. We would never let an animal suffer here in Australia the way they do sometimes in these places. But you've got to be careful going in as, you know, Western know-all, telling them what to do. They don't appreciate it. You've got to be sensitive to their beliefs, their culture, their spirituality. So you have to tread very carefully in this regard, but you can still voice an opinion as I did. Yeah, there was a program a, a number of years ago to neuter them, um, and it went okay for a while, but then something went astray, and I, I think it was probably not enough, uh, you know, building of trust or contacting and getting the all the stakeholders behind it, and it was actually the monastic community that objected to it very strongly, and it was stopped immediately. I would say, though, in my experience, these town dogs are a problem. They do need to be fed and they need health care and all the rest of it. But the bigger problem for wildlife comes in the remote areas. And now and it comes from the military. Yes, the military have a lot of rations. You know, they eat out of tin cans, basically. Yeah. And they have a terrible disposal system. They just throw mm -hmm. the tin cans around and there's dozens of dogs they pack up there. Uh, and, you know, they are going to run around and kill any blue sheep. They probably do kill snow leopards. I, I've no, I don't know of an instance, but it could happen. So sure. it, it's a huge problem. Yes, definitely a big problem. And of course, in general, we talked about the other day, the Indian Army have a big presence there. You've got China, you know, on the border there. And of course, they're talking about building highways and dams and, you know, snow leopard habitat is increasingly under threat for a variety of uh, man-made reasons. Yeah, we, uh -huh. we call all that stuff infrastructure. So roads are probably one of the most destructive things across the Snow Leopard Range, not just yeah. Ladakh, in mm -hmm. Nepal and China, everywhere. And, you know, with Ladakh, one of the problems is that Ladakh is now the uh, home for the Northern Command that protects that border with China. Yeah. So everybody's up there. And before it used to be in the lowlands and there'd just be a smaller contingent up. And the whole valley now is taken up with army camps. So it's, it's pretty cool. Well, we're quite shocked when we're there, just going out of lay, how many, of course, you only get skittled by all these uh, big army trucks coming at you at 100 miles an hour. 
on these snowy roads. You know, we, we were in a car. They don't have, usually don't have chains. We did one portion, but the rest of the time, little cars going up these snowy roads and um, fighter jets going over. And I just imagine how that would freak out a snow leopard, these, these fighter jets going over the territory. Mm -hmm. Very scary. Yeah. Um, and particularly since that recent, more recent Chinese incursion where people were killed, they have vastly increased their presence there. Right. Yeah. I just never pictured fighter jets going over snow leopard habitat, but I guess that makes sense. That's, that's a new image for me. Of a, of a fighter jet going over there. Yeah, well, it's also caused avalanches and everything. When I first yeah. heard it, it was an earthquake starting. I thought, what, what was that? You know, an avalanche or something. And it's a, these fighter jets going over. Not every other day, but enough to be worrisome. Yeah. Yeah, I bet it's affecting the monastery right at the end of the runway now. That must just be, yeah. be shaken apart. Yep. Yep. Oh my yeah. God. It's, uh, so it's troubling, but we've just got to keep on keeping on and um, be very vigilant with education. Uh, it's wonderful in the dark, you know, school children are very involved, teachers are very involved. So it's a matter of keeping up with that. And I'm involved with Vets Beyond Borders here who are trying very hard. They've always sent Australian vets to lay to uh, desex and, and uh, treat rabies and all of that in the area. So when they can go back, um, that's also a very good thing to be involved with. Um, yeah. You know, because they get a lot of dog bites. Even if you don't get rabies from a dog bite, you don't want to get bitten by a stray dog in Ladakh or anywhere because you can get no. septicemia. And they do get a lot of dog bite uh, problems there. And same in Bhutan, 12 dog bites a week wow. going to the Digme Dorji Hospital in Timpu. Well, you know, I always think uh, we were lucky enough to spend the 90s, much of the 90s working in in Tibet and Lhasa and that surrounding area. And of course, that's the center culturally for thousands of years of Tibet mm -hmm. center. And mm -hmm. now it's totally changed with mm -hmm. the Chinese. It's an occupation really. And Ladakh is more Tibetan than Tibet is these days. Absolutely, so well, the monasteries are left alone. Go to, go to Ladakh. <laughs> the monasteries oh, are- look, there's a small yeah. little leopard that just walked in front of Darla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's that's our little official leopard. There's actually a woman I contacted. There's a woman in uh, at UCLA. She takes these Buddhists. These she's a Buddhist. Uh, she takes um, monastery tours to Ladakh. She's been there five times, and we're going to have a um, a chat soon. And she was saying how the monasteries are just booming there, and it, exactly what you've said. They're left alone. They're encouraged. They're flourishing there, and it is like right. little Tibet up there. And of course, the landscape. I haven't been to Tibet, but as you know, it's very stark. And they don't call it the second roof of the world for nothing, which is what they used to call Tibet, the roof of the world. Mm -hmm. so that's good Margaret, thing. you know, on your, you had been to that part of the world before, but this was your first real snow leopard trek. Was there something that really surprised you about the experience that you weren't at all prepared for? Um, um, other well, than the cold, I mean, you were prepared for that, but... Of course, we're very much on a quest to see a snow leopard. And we kept saying before the trip, even beginning in late, if we don't see one, one that's okay. You know, we, it's amazing to be here. The people are lovely. The landscape is beautiful. But, oh, we so much wanted to see a snow leopard. But I think we had our little scripts in our mind. If we didn't see one, we'd say it's okay. <laughs> but it would not have been okay. In fact, Jigmat had been with a group of um, Japanese uh, visitors, uh, wildlife enthusiasts, who'd been up in a very similar area. And they stayed in Rumbak for 10 days. They saw nothing. So the next day we, we rocked up, just three of us, and we saw one. It's just a roll of the dice. Um, I think I was just, a, and I'd been to Bhutan 11 times. Been to, I've only been to Nepal twice, but I was just awestruck by the beauty of Ladakh, this infinity of snowy beauty. And I say to people, go there in winter. And they say, oh, it's too cold. I couldn't handle it. It, you know, if you, as I said, if you're sort of with the gear and you're with the right people, you feel very safe and snug. I never felt at risk. Anything could happen any time. Anything could happen any time anywhere. Uh, so um, I urge people to go there in winter. It's completely doable, unless you have some medical condition where you can't cope with cold temperatures or a lung problem or something. Um, but if you're pretty fit and healthy, you know, go for it because you're not going to have the opportunity to see. And not just the snow leopards. You know, we saw, saw golden eagles. We saw Himalayan wolf tracks. We saw a red fox, extraordinary birds. And, and when you go with, with people like Jigmet and Nobu, they see things we wouldn't see in 
10 years, they just notice things. And they'll say, look, there's a, a, a golden eagle nest. And so there was a whole panoply of other wildlife that we, we saw. So it was just a feast for the eyes and the heart and the spirit, definitely. Well, it is, and it's so sparsely populated. Well, Bhutan is very sparsely populated too. There's only about 900,000 people, but compared to India, you know, which is just a tsunami of people, over a billion people, I like, to me, less people, the happier I am. I now only are really interested in going to remote wilderness areas. And I was very lucky to go to the Arctic uh, in Norway uh, a few years ago and saw polar bears. So that's what I like doing. I like seeing animals in the wild. And that was the great thing about the book. I remember thinking, and I didn't have to fight for it. I didn't want photographs of snow leopards in zoos, which I know is the key to their survival, the breeding programs. But it was great that we had quite a fixed view that there'll be no zoo photographs and we triumphed in that regard i think i think bjorn's idea of portraying the idea of someone actually behind the camera and in the moment rather yeah. than a camera trap that you were in that moment and the struggle i think our book was about the struggle of of getting there and whether or not the cat was going to allow you to see it and uh, it was an anthropological adventure, this book, and, and more, you know, more so than a biological one. I think, I think Bjorn had the right idea to narrow our focus, not that there's anything wrong, like you said, with, with our zoo partners, you know, it's just, um, we, we wanted to narrow the focus so that people would actually feel like they were there or they'd want to go there. And that's, um, and Darla is so right that that is a testament to conservation action working, that people are able to go and see these animals now, um, and that they're and more easily. That and it's also, you know, about from the ground up, from people there who live there, who generations of people will live there and be the most the critical factor in conserving these species. We are fly, we what we call FIFO, we fly in, fly out people. They live there. That's their permanent home. And that is the key to the survival of these animals. And of course, we can create awareness that they're on the ground there. And that's where the critical work is being done and has to continue. I thought with Jack, you know, he was also in that situation where he'd been there for days and didn't see one. As yeah. I said, the, one I was day the rock, about the rock moved. He was looking at a rock and the rock moved. <laughs> and that yeah, was Jack the, said that, you moment. know, that he was expecting to see this mystical animal way up in the mountains and no one around and, you know, some magical moment. And he said, instead, here was an animal who had killed one of the people's livestock and was in jeopardy of being killed itself in retaliation. And he said, I, I bought a yak burger, you know, he, he donated money to the yes. herder and he said, I, I bought a yak burger for a snow leopard, but he said it was a totally, not what I planned, not what I expected. I thought I'd see this mystical animal, you know, up and, you know, come walking across the rocks. And instead here it was, you know, just a few hundred feet from town and it had taken out a yak. And it was a totally different experience, but it was still very moving to him to be in the presence of this animal and be able to sit there for hours and watch it. Absolutely, yeah. So it you uh, can't you can't choreograph what's going to happen up there, you know. Every, every which is testament. I mean, every single essay in the book is strikingly different as to what people experienced. Um, and Jigmet told us lots of stories as well of, of his sightings and the. The variety of experiences that he has um, he has gone through. He once saw one actually in summer. I think it was about ten meters away. Just sort of went in, virtually what Rodney was saying before about that Indian group. It virtually just wandered across the road like a dog in summer. Well, then, Tashi's pictures from summertime. Uh, they were he was in the field and they were doing some kind of a count. Um, I don't remember what animal they were counting. It's um, it's in the book and he he said all of a sudden there was a snow leopard just standing there a couple yeah. like 100 feet away and then it crouched down in the grass and they waited and waited and waited and they thought it had left and they walked over and there it was right in front of them 
uh, they walked right up to it and it was just sitting there looking at them and then it got up and walked away. He couldn't believe it. And that was in summertime in the middle well, of a number, field. A number of people have said to me, you know, were you in danger? Could one have attacked you? And I think Rodney told me um, there's been no known attacks on human beings. It's no leopards, you know, here's a tiger or a lion. I've been in Africa and very close to a lioness, which is a bit risky. But, um, you know, they, they, they're not hunting us. They're, they're very shy very anxious creatures in that regard. They don't want to have close contact. They certainly aren't looking to attack and kill or eat you. Um, but, but there's all these, you have to dem demystify some of these ideas in people's minds that they're a dangerous animal that could eat you if you're out there in the wild. It just almost couldn't possibly happen. Yeah, they're actually very dangerous. You can grab them by the tail and pull them and they, you know, they will won't attack you. Wow. Uh, you would never, oh, you'd never yeah. do that with a common lip, but you, you get yes. closer yeah. in trouble. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or a puma, or so many other things, but not sweet snow leopards. Well, I like to think they docile because of the Buddhist population that they evolved with. You know. Yes. I I don't know how far back it goes, of course, but Tibetans have been on the Tibetan plateau. I think at least uh, uh, three to six thousand years, something like that. But anyway, who knows? They're an iconic animal in the area, and uh, so I just feel very privileged to be involved in their conservation, even with this the book contribution and will to my last breath try to help snow leopards stay and flourish. Yeah, well, Margaret. We we truly appreciate all you do for snow leopards and wildlife. And thank you so much for making this book happen and uh, for having the idea and, and for coming and chatting with us today. It's been fun. Um, it's always nice to talk to Margaret and it's already tomorrow morning in, in Sydney. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's uh, Friday morning. In the morning. Yeah. A lot of us are are still on Thursday, but thank you for getting up and talking to us and sharing your experience and all you do for snow leopards and your dedication to them. We truly well, thank you very much. Really appreciate thank you for inviting me. And I look, I really want to say I was a facilitator of this. With the people who did the hard work were Siobhan and your John and all the incredible photographers and writers, uh, Katie, everybody. Um, they made it happen, you know. I was just the go-between. So uh, warmest congratulations to the entire team and for Rodney and Dala for hanging in there and believed it would happen. And it did happen. <laughs> well, yeah, I, well kept I handed it over. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, you kept saying it was going to happen and I believe you. <laughs> well, I did have some slightly shaky moments there and I can't wait to get to the wildlife fair, hopefully in one October and we can all sit around and have a nice meal and some wine and, and uh, toast. We'll do that. Snow leopards and the, and the searching for the snow leopard team. Yes. And share stories and everything. Yes, I look forward to yes. that. That would be great. Oh, oh, Rodney, it's worse than that. It's not showing. Sometimes I'm so boastful about seeing a snow leopard. I'm ashamed. You know, people say, <laughs> what was it like? And I go on and on and on and on about it. <laughs> Maybe, you know, it's a strange thing. I mean, I'm a very happy, optimistic person, but I have felt happier since I saw a snow leopard. <laughs> I wanted to hear like one little reading from the book. <laughs> It's partly Bjorn's words, because of course I haven't been there and partly mine, but it comes from the section called the bond. And I just, it's not very long and I wanted to share it with everyone before we go. It's negative four degrees and the sun is starting to go down for almost an hour. You've been lying dead still, observing the small leopard making its way up the mountainside. Only about 200 feet away, it suddenly stops. Anxious not to be discovered, you hardly dare to breathe. Your frozen body is in pain, and ultimately you have no other choice than to change position. There is only the slightest sound of your movement, yet the snow leopard has reacted, your presence having been revealed. Glimmering in the approaching darkness, the snow leopard's icy blue eyes meet yours. Transfixed, you experience a silent communication with the great cat. For no more than a moment or two, it studies you, then turns away and moves on, having acknowledged the presence of its uninvited guest. Beautiful. Poetry in motion. <laughs>
Yeah. Beautiful. They are. Great. They will always see you before you see them, always. <laughs> <laughs> the slightest movement. Yeah, I think I, I think they have a lot of typical cat characteristics in a way. Movement mm. really does attract even our, our country down here. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, our next cat chat will be with Jack Wonderly in a couple weeks. And then we'll have another cat chat in August with Ula Muhammad from the BWCDO in Pakistan. So that's our next cat chats that are scheduled. And thank you, Rodney and Darla, for joining us today. And thank you, Darla, for helping me with the, uh, with the chat feature. Um, it's kind of hard to run all these different things. I'm still learning. And thank you, Margaret, for joining us, even though you have such a bad cold. You did great. And it's so wonderful to see you. It's for the world. Okay. As I say in the doc, Julie's. <laughs> Julie's. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a great day. Thank, thank you. Love to all. Bye. 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 Bye.